I was basically like, hey, like, you guys are about to get fucking worked. Like, straight up work. Like, there's nothing I can do about it. These dudes are no joke. You really need to get the fuck out of here. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000 punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Benny Horowitz was a show promoter at the Manville, New Jersey Elks Lodge back in the late 90s. You also might know him from his bands Mercy Union and Gaslight Anthem. I obviously have heard of Gaslight, but had no idea that he even promoted shows back then until roadie extraordinaire Monkey Cipriano filled me in and then he made an intro. Benny was more than excited to spend close to two hours talking about the New Jersey scene. Fun fact, this interview was going to be a two-parter because we had to end the first part after an hour because he had to do some stuff, and we continued a week later and did another hour. However, since I have a special guest for episode 50, I wanted to keep that spot for him, so I decided to keep this one at uh, as one interview for episode 49. Plus, the Barker interview was like three hours, so this one's way shorter than that, and uh, it's a podcast, so fucking suck it up. I got Benny on the phone twice. And this is what we talked about. Gaslight Anthem's current status, Ricky Supporta, the Morris County Youth Crew, his thoughts on Manville, New Jersey in general, drinking at Elks Lodges, crazy show stories, John Hiltz doing sound, E-Town Concrete broken mic story, Monkey the world famous roadie, dealing with band contracts, Earth Crisis, how a 16-year-old kid prints flyers when he's broke, the magic of pagers, the ABA, the Punk Rock Fantasy Baseball League, and a ton more. Before we begin, this week's episode is sponsored by my new book, How to Get Divorced, a guide for people currently going through some shit. This is based on my comic that I do daily on Instagram, uh, Daily Bread. You can find it on Instagram at Your Daily Bread. But I decided to do uh, another book, and the first one was just a collaboration of comics that I did. But this one, I started as a joke because I kept seeing all of these download my top 10 secrets for marketing and all this bullshit. And I thought it'd be kind of funny to make a serious one. So it was going to be, so I started this as a guide and it ended up turning into more than that. And, uh, and I'm pretty stoked on it because right now the, the ebook is available. The physical copy is going to be available in a couple weeks, but it is meant for people who are going through a divorce uh, and they didn't really, they don't really have anything to help them. And this is like kind of a funny way uh, and a, to go through a serious situation. So uh, if you want to check it out, just go to yourdailybread.com. Bread is B-R-E-D, no A. And you can download it for free. Thank you again for all the people who have donated to the podcast or our Patreons. Uh, you're my favorite people in the entire fucking world. And if you haven't done either of those, then you are shit to me. No, I'm just kidding. You're not shit to me. But if you want to become a Patreon, you could just go to thiswasthescene.com and click on the button for... Uh, the purple button that says more bonus material. And if you want to just do a one-time donation, which is very helpful because the uh, monthly fee for this has gone up since these episodes have gotten longer and the server space has had to increase. So any help is fantastic. Um, yeah, Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. I am um, holding yeah. it in front of my mouth, not in my ear. So That's fine. at least my ear cancer is... is uh... <laughs> Is diminished slightly. Good old ear cancer. <laughs> That's a thing, right? I think so. I think it's just brain cancer. I think it goes way past oh. it. Yeah. yeah. It's just till it'll just kill you. It just gets all of it. <laughs> um. So. So sorry in advance for being so elusive. Oh, dude, um, I don't give a fuck. I really. I uh. I don't want it to think like I was being like Mr. Cool. I'm really just very scattered. It's more that. Oh no, man! Oh, don't don't even sweat it. I've had a. Uh, I mean, everyone has just adult schedules, and you know, some people are in bands and still tour, and some people are working jobs, and some people are just, you know, they uh, they just try to find time. They have kids and families and stuff. Yeah, like that. that's yeah. my issue. Is when when I'm home, uh, the daytimes are filled with kids. Normally, uh, I have like two little ones, and oh, then nice. when we were booking it, I was doing like. I was on tour and stuff, so that's why I was getting so confused. Are you in an, a, a newer band now too, or like you guys doing a bunch of side projects? Well, I have a main band now called Mercy Union. Um, 
that's a band that I put together last year with with Jared Hart from the Scandals okay. and Rocky from Let Me Run and a couple other guys. Um, and we put out a record in October, and that's kind of the full time thing I'm doing. We're going on a doing main support for Laura Jane Grace tour in the spring. Damn. Um, and yeah, so that's the main thing. And then I was touring with a band called Antarctico Vespucci, who's um, a side project of two singer songwriters, Jeff Rosenstock and Chris Farron. Uh, and I play drums on all their records. And then when they uh, play, which is rarely, uh, I go out and do those tours too. So that was just like a two week tour I was on too. That's fucking sick, man. I mean, so is, yeah. is Gaslight, like, are you guys on a hiatus? Because I know that you guys will put out a record, and you'll tour, and then Brian will do something, and you guys kind of do your own shit, or... Yeah, right now, it's, like, kind of the same exact place we left it when we stopped, and even before we did those shows this summer, it's just on break. Um, you know, we know about as much of the future as other as, as anyone on the outside knows. Um, you know, we just like to make sure people know it's not like, it's not contentious. We didn't break up. No one hates each other. It's like nothing like that. Um, and you know, we had an opportunity this summer, you know, it was like the 10 year anniversary of 59 sound, which for us is like, if there's anything you're gonna mark in your career, you know, that's like the type of thing we thought we should, we should do. And also when we started thinking about it, it felt like nothing but positive and fun yeah, and, and good rather than any of the other stuff, which is kind of what is going to dictate most of our decisions. Um, so yeah, we did the shows this summer and they were like mad fun. <laughs> like everything went great. <laughs> and awesome. then, uh, and then just are back in like kind of the same mode, hibernation mode. Everybody's working on their own projects and different things. And, when the time comes to write or play or any of that, like we'll, we'll address it. But yeah, it's just totally wide open still. That's awesome. I mean, I, I think that the, the way we all grew up in bands was that's all you did and you had to just go and couldn't stop. And it's like, we all had that mentality. And the one thing I've got from a lot of these interviews with people is, uh, you know, they all had that. And then it just creates this crazy turmoil and get all people get emotional and, and I think a lot of bands forget and just like, Hey, wait, we, we can just stop for a while <laughs> and then we could come yeah. back and do this. I mean, you guys, I think some bands, they might be a little scared of that because they might find that they're obsolete, you know, and there's definitely different levels of yeah. where people recognize. I mean, you guys obviously <laughs> I've done a little well, quite well for yourselves. <laughs> yeah. There's certainly no like black or white to it. And I understand where people, I mean, like, you get stuck in a position just like we started to get stuck. And if we yeah. allowed ourselves to continue, we would have been stuck, which is like, you know, everybody basically you're like trying your hardest forever to just make this the thing that pays for your life. You know, yeah. like yeah. if you ask most, especially like punk or hardcore kids, since like the idea of, you know, mega starter is, uh, look down upon um you know the common answer would probably be just like hey i just want to make enough to like pay rent playing music that's it i think the common you know? answer should be hey go uh, fuck yourself <laughs> well yeah i mean yeah. you can't my, say that i could say that business. yeah dude it's like oh i'm sorry <laughs> yeah are you gonna pay for my fucking bills oh no then right. shut the fuck up like well I, I mean that's the thing that i think <laughs> and even bands get stuck in is like is like you have this say you have a great record that does well and you have a really successful touring cycle and it puts yourself in a position where you're like, Oh, you know what? Fuck it. I'll have a kid now. Yeah. Cause we're doing it right. You know? Oh shit. Like I'll get into this house. Why not? Like, yeah. like Oh, I could buy things. Cool. And I'll have to, I can, exactly. I can just play in the band. All of a sudden, two years later, you know, like out of nowhere, some fucking a bass player quits, uh, um, some weird shit happens, a label, like anything where all of a sudden your, your thing is just unplugged. And if you, yeah. if you spent 20 years trying to get to that point and now all of a sudden you're like a 37 year old guitar player, basically with no fucking job and a family in a house now, you know? <laughs> so like, like the decisions people have to make are tricky and I can justifiably admit that like the 16 year old version of myself 
talked a whole lot of shit about stuff I had no idea about. Oh, oh fuck. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I mean, even at one point, I mean, there it definitely came out of my mouth at one point in my life. You know, I'll fucking, I'll kill myself before I'm in a major label, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then I find myself signing on the dotted line being like, you know what? I got to do it, man. I got to do it. Like, I think it's almost like a, um, what's the word? Uh, not karma. Um, what is that shit when you say something and the total reverse happens? Uh, the Murphy's Law? Yeah, it's like Murphy's Law. You say it out loud and you truly believe it, and all of a sudden it's presented to you. It's like, all right, asshole. Like, you know, yeah, where, yeah. Where, where do you Call believe now? Yeah. Call your bluff. Thank and you're, you're like, yeah. and you're like, ah, I fooled you. I fooled yeah. you. Thanks for taking my bluff. I'll sign this fucking thing. You exactly. Stab my and you're vein. left with that thing. You know, it's easy when you're 16, but when you're like in your mid 20s, and the other option is. 30 more hours a week at the pizza place or yeah. signed to universal records. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I thought you I guys, know. I see the thing is though, I thought you guys have done it well from the beginning where you guys were, and you know, we're definitely going to talk about um, the Jersey scene and go back. But I think um, just right where we are right now is where I want to stay for a minute. I think, uh, cause you know, I met Brian, 20 years ago when he was in my band right. for like a hot yeah, minute yeah. and so yeah, i got definitely. to like right when I, I i got to meet him when he was just this dude of go, like i he's a songwriter and he was just going i need to just keep going in directions that work for me so i'm going to join this band that doesn't work i'm going to yep. leave and he felt his gut and then he just obviously joined with you guys you had this charming man first and then you changed the name to gaslight anthem right yeah because mm-hmm. i remember seeing you guys there was a show I had moved back to Jersey from California in 2004, and okay. I started a like a side band or started a band with my friends. It was like I was like I don't want to tour, I just want to play music. And we played this show in it was like Wayne or I forget what the fuck it was, but you guys were there uh, for some reason. You guys were there watching this show, hmm. and I saw Brian the first time I had seen him in years, and I was like, hey, shit, what's up, man? He's like, hey, yeah, uh, you know, uh, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, well. Um, He's like, I got this band. We're just going for it. We're we're just gonna do it full time. That's when you guys were this charming man. I was like, oh, that's cool, man. I'm like, wow, that's it's crazy. You're gonna do it. And all of a sudden, my friend sent me a link, and I, I, I hit her up. It was um, uh, you know, Ricky Supporta. Of course. So Ricky, uh, he married Nina. Um, yeah. Okay. So Nina, me, me and her were friends, and I was talking to her. I messaged her in like 2006 or seven. I was like, Hey, do you have any music you're listening to? She goes, Oh, I love this band. You got to check it out. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I'm listening to it. I go, Wait, that sounds like Brian. That's awesome. <laughs> and then it just like turned. I was like, Fuck, man. And you guys just like exploded and, and did well. But my point was, yeah, and and all the picture, all like the coolest pictures we have from the beginning are all Ricky's Ricky support us pictures. Oh, really? Anyway, yeah, yeah. Because I knew Ricky from, you know, basically, I'm sure we'll get into it through yeah. the course of the conversation, but I basically, like, handed the Manville Elks to Ricky, you know, like, we were, no um, shit. you know, uh, so I knew him when, shit, like, I was 17, he was, like, 15 or 16. Cause, always had you know, the camera on his neck, always taking pictures. Yep. Always, and just, yep. like, the sweetest kid with, like an older brother who they are nothing alike yeah, at all. Nothing alike. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Just like this came out of nowhere, but like still, I mean, you'll, you're still hard pressed to find a fucking sweeter kid than that. Even to this day. Yeah. yeah but I, uh, what was the, <laughs> what was the name of your band that played? Uh, we were, sure uh, I knew it. We were Lane Meyer. No, no. The one that you had back together. Like, oh, before. Arcade Academy. We were called Arcade okay. Academy. Um, and that I don't remember. Yeah. Lane Meyer, of course I know. Oh, that's cool. Wow. I was, I was. I'm gonna have uh, that be the sound clip. <laughs> well, listen, I was. I was a big. I was a big um, fan and also friend of a lot of the pinball records. Yeah. Shit, back then and like Jay and that crew because my friends were in a band called Nowhere Fast, which yeah. I'm sure you knew. Oh yeah. And oh, uh, really. yeah, like Tyler and I played like little league baseball together. Like we knew each other when we were like little little kids. So. That's wild. Even dude. even when Nowhere Fast, they were still called Seven Ten Split. I would like go up and uh, sing like an Operation Ivy song with them when they would play shows and stuff. I must I was... have I must have bumped into you so many times and I'm sure. Then. Are I'm you, sure. you 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 obvi- you must have booked a show that we played because we played Manville like a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty Lodge. sure I did. That was that was the Oak Lodge with like all the the heads, all the uh, the dead animal heads <laughs> all around it. Yeah, right? there's a cup. There was a couple nice elk heads 
hanging out in there, yeah. <laughs> Did and you? Then, uh, uh, oh, sorry, and then, you know, all the glossies of the exalted rulers of past and present. That was... Oh, man, I forgot and, about that. And then at one show, someone did. Someone stole an exalted ruler off the wall. Obviously. And that was, like, one of the biggest, like, deal breakers of when that venue started to go down was when someone stole an exalted <laughs> ruler. <laughs> <laughs> Did you book the uh, Broadway's Tuesday show when they went on their uh, tour together? No, I think that was Ricky, actually. That was, that was just after. That was sort of when, like, basically I was booking the hall for Ricky because I had worked out a deal with those guys that they wouldn't book it to anybody else but me. Okay. And they were, like, very cool and loyal to me. And But towards the end of high school, which was when I was really, like, doing the man I, you know the manville stuff was probably in full swing like my junior year of high school is probably when like the coolest stuff was going on and then sometime by like the middle point of senior year i had this like last effort ditch to kind of be like a normal kid like like i uh you know like just was starting to go to like actual high school parties and i mm. went on like my senior tr i think i felt like i had missed like a part of like my school experience because i was completely checked out of it um for well let me part. let me let me go back a bit and then take and have sure. you take me there because i always like to give everyone the real origin get the because everyone listening always has this starting point of where they love music and i like to really find that out with anyone i'm, I'm interviewing because i think it's like a great connecting point I mean, I think a lot of people listening to this, you know, they'll they'll they've heard a gaslight. They know who you are, um, which is going to be cool uh, for them. And they can like hear about New Jersey and shit. And um, but so I want to go back and ask and, you know, and connect because everyone connects like on how they love music. Because they're like, oh, and it, per it like kind of like levels the playing field with everyone because everyone's been sure. there. You know, it's almost like you ever, yeah, see that, yeah. you ever see that show Hot Ones on YouTube. You ever watch that? I have. No, no, I haven't. Let's check it out. It's like they sit there and just eat hot wings and they get hot, hotter and hotter. But the interviewer, he's eating the wings with the person he's interviewing. And he's interviewing like, you know, Bill Burr and, you know, people right, like right. Lake but, but like it just puts them on this level where they just trust each other. <laughs> so right. it's like, sure, sure. I always find when people talk about that. But um, before I jump into that, anyone listening, again, you know, Benny isn't Gaslight, but he was uh, a crucial part of the Jersey scene. And a lot of interviews I've been doing lately um have been going outside of jersey and by this point uh there's there's definitely uh, quite a few episodes between when i'm interviewing him and when it's going to come out and a lot of have come out by the time you're listening to this but this is going to be very focused on the jersey scene which is why i started the podcast and um monkey works for me yeah <laughs> and i like so monkey he's episode six i think i interviewed him because he he used to roadie for big wig and he hits me up. He's like, dude, he's like, you got to talk to Benny he used to like book a lot of shows back then. I was like, fucking no way. I didn't know, you know, cause I knew we were all, you guys are from Jersey, but I didn't know you were all on the scene. So I'm going to get to there. That was a very long winded way to say <laughs> what got you as a young kid. Like, do you remember the moment when you're listening? It doesn't have to be punk rock, just music in general, where you're listening to a song and what the band was, or the song was, you were like, Oh man, like this, I ha I have to pay attention to music now. You know, it was it was interesting for me because I just kind of like grew up um, the like the rock and roll kind of narrative was like really in front of my face before I even really knew what was going on. Like um, the music I remember as like a little kid was more my father's music, which my dad's like an old uh, an older Jewish guy from the Bronx. So it's like basically a rule. You have to be into soul music. Um and Paul Simon. Nice. Those are those are the two things old Jewish guys in the Bronx like have to be into. <laughs> yeah. um, so I always remember like, you know, classic Motown Temptations and like Aretha Franklin and like stuff like that for my dad. But then like my mom, who was, you know, a very creative and wild sort of spirit in a lot of ways, she she really got into classic rock and particularly like Queen and oh, the yeah. who and zeppelin and stuff like that and she actually got so involved in it that she became a queenie which is at the time this is pre-internet um these were people who had joined the queen fan club yep and like pen palled with each other you know what i mean so she had maybe a half a dozen all women from like around the world literally that she'd pen pal with about queen um and then started getting really into the vinyl 
and really into the collector stuff. So, you know, my parents were getting divorced. I was with my mom a lot. And, you know, I'm talking like 10, 11 years old on the weekend, she'd be taking me to to record shows, you know, like those. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah. Like, so, you know, That's and awesome. it's funny, I'm actually, I'm actually in a 7-Eleven parking lot on 22 in North Plainfield right now, just because of what I, where I had to be to make this interview happen. And it's funny because the hotel we used to go is literally like a few miles down the road. We used to go to this, I think it was a Holiday Inn in Springfield on 22 was the one that always hosted those record shows. So the big like, you know, convention center part of it in the bottom would be filled with, you know, record vendors, like yep. store guys and stuff like that. Mm hmm. And she'd take me there, and, you know, my musical taste wasn't exactly nuanced yet. I was, you know, a first-time drummer really into rock and roll. So my favorite bands at the time were, like, Guns N' Roses, Skid Row, uh, some classic rock stuff. I loved Rush. I already loved Zeppelin, was stuff that because, like that. Because, so you, you were playing drums up until you were 10 at this point? I had already gotten a kit by then. Yeah. Okay. Um, I got a kit in like fifth grade, like nine or 10. And um, I kind of had a very. So that's another thing that ties into the story. I'll bring this all together. Yeah. Basically. I mean, it's funny when I talk about it now, it's almost like my destiny was written for me when I think about how many kind of like rock and roll things sort of got thrown my way <laughs> early on. But <laughs> So this all coincided with, so I would go to these record shows and I, I think that really just not only, you know, gave me a love for the music, but you know, it gave me a real love for like the narrative of rock and roll, you know what I mean? Which like, I still to this day totally believe in, like it's more than music, you know what I mean? It's, it's culture, it's a place that, you know, take punk and hardcore out of it, that's a part of rock and roll, like. This has always been the place a little bit for like the outsiders and it's always given an avenue to people who need an avenue to go. I mean, I'm talking like people literally thought Elvis was the devil, you know, and yeah. now there's like Christian rock bands and like it's just something that's permeated like it's broken like color lines. It's it's done so many things that are just so beyond like music. You yeah, know what I mean, so totally get it. So I'm like I'm like semi-obsessed with just the thing you know even more so than music like uh the culture behind it you know and even the guys like when you're 11 years old and you see these two like real rock and roll looking dudes behind like a record vendor table telling you about i would have listened to fucking anything those dudes said i would have hung on every word listened to every recommendation they gave me because to me, they were like legit as fuck, you know, like yep. these dudes are cool and they're legit. And like, um, so that happened. And then I did start playing drums independently of this. I, I had joined school band in like fourth grade, sort of arbitrarily chose drums. There's really nothing like romantic about that thing. Um, <laughs> Well, especially and, uh, then, because you only had like one drum. You had a snare. Yeah, or, yeah. Or like you, you're playing a pad. You know. Yeah. So I don't know. Like, yeah, I started doing paradiddles in fourth grade. Like nice. no, nothing crazy. But then, uh, shortly after, my my mom, my parents were already getting divorced. I was living with my mom, and my mom is a legal secretary, but she had taken on a job as a manicurist, as like a second job, just to get some extra cash and shit. And, you know, in her personality, she got really into it and really good at it, like kind of fast. And um, she was friends with this woman, Michelle. And one day we were like driving by Michelle's house. I think it was in Somerville, um, which is the town I grew up in. And, okay. uh, and we cruised by and we went in and inside of Michelle's living room was just like a giant drum set with like tons of records and shit. And it turned out Michelle's boyfriend was a local drummer. Um, rock and roll dude, his name was Tommy O'Donnell. Uh, and I was like, holy shit, look, drum set. You know, I had kind of only been fucking with the pad and stuff. Yeah. And, and then, you know, I jumped on this thing and that definitely like was kind of the like, okay, mom, like you're getting me a drum set, you know, like, like that's happening now, you know? Um, so 
for the next birthday I had, we went to that like Rondo Music on 22, got one of those real cheap. It was a company called Century, which I don't even think makes drums anymore. They make like horns and stuff. Um, <laughs> Sellouts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What the fuck? Man? Yeah, and, that, uh, that's the hot trend. <laughs> and then like once I got the kit, I, I started going over to Tommy and Michelle's house every once in a while. Like my mom would bring me over. She would sit in the kitchen with Michelle and just like drink tea and smoke cigarettes and chill. And uh, me and Tommy would like fuck around with his kit. And he... He was real cool, but he did, he wasn't like a trained guy. Um, he was just like a rock and roll dude. So he used to like kind of play along to records uh, and then show me the parts and then have me play. And like, you know, kind of went back and forth like that for a while. And so and that's actually still like to this day, kind of how I practice. Um, I like if a new record comes out that I really like one of my first instincts is to like get behind my drum set and just start learning it. Um, and that, that's still a very functional way. Like I practice and get better is just by learning other people's shit. And I think yeah. part of it is because of the way I learned with Tommy, like instead of, you know, writing it all out and thinking about it in that way, it was all ear, you know, it was all just trying to like, how they do that. How can I do that? You know? Yeah. Like how can I play what I heard? And, and in reality, I realize now that like half the shit I was playing for many, many years was not the actual thing other people were playing because <laughs> I, I could have like there might have been some benefit to a balance of someone teaching me the actual like technique to doing it. Um, that took me a long time to kind of figure out on my own. But uh, but yeah, that's kind of the way it started. And, and with everything conglomerated together. I really like fell in love with drums and was like already obsessed with rock and roll. Um, and then shortly after that, it all tied together where like I met my old best friend, Steve Lawson. Um, you know, I'm still friendly with like, and we were in sixth grade band together and it turned out his older brother, Dave was the guy who, um, he did like the cover art for uniform choice screaming for change. He did the cover art for like the first shades apart record. Oh, wow. Uh, and he was just tapped into that, like central Jersey punk rock scene. So my boy, Steve was like nine, 10 years old. And he was like at vision shows and at, you know, uh, wow. uniform, like all these shows, like, and he was a very like well-known kid in that scene. Cause he was like wild and little, you know, uh, and he ended up being like my best friend and teaching me about like, he's the one who kind of, you know, my family had just really split. I was kind of like totally on my own in reality. And yeah. And I found this thing, you know, like, like he's the one who straight up turned me into like skateboarding, which, you know, at that time, I know it's not like this anymore, but you know, at that time was so closely tied to like punk rock and hardcore. Like, Oh it was yeah. Almost, it was like hands and hands. Know, yeah, when you got your first skateboard, like, you got an Operation Ivy record. Like, that was, like, par yeah. for the course, you know? Yeah, it was like that and, or Pennywise uh, or No Effects yeah, would be the soundtrack. Yeah, of the, yeah, something like that. So, you know, and then he started making me some mix mixes and stuff, and he was already tied into kind of, like, the hardcore scene. And then I just went, like, somewhere around that time, I sort of all, fell in love with hardcore and started playing in my first band, like, all somewhere in the middle of middle school there. And that's kind of just when it all like, you know, uh, snowballed into basically the only thing I cared about, you know, what was like, so I, I liked what you said before about how music is that place where people who are kind of, I think you said outcasts where they can go and connect. Like, what was your, what was your high school experience? Like where did you, were you the kind of person that just could fit into any group and you just had friends that they weren't your tight friends, but you were like, Oh, I can hang out with the jocks. I can have them. Or are you kind of an outcast where you were just by yourself and you felt like, um, I'm trying to like, I think like putting the words in your mouth, but what, what was your experience in high school? Like where, where did you think you stood as far as, um, what group you, you hung with? I don't know. It was tricky. Like it was, you know, I've definitely like a big enough and loud enough and, obnoxious enough kid that I wasn't like a total isolated kid who got beat up by people and stuff like that. Like 
I was still a little asshole. Like if some <laughs> football player was fucking with me, I would have like gotten into it with the football player. You know what I mean? Like, okay. Um, so you didn't take any shit then. No, 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 definitely not. Nice. I mean, I was, you know, um, yeah. And I think my upbringing, I mean, that's what you get when you take a, a, a progressive Jewish kid and, and raise him in fucking white trash land, you know, like <laughs> you start to get a little chippiness, which I still have, you know, especially against <laughs> shit like that. Um, <laughs> So, like, but um, I think I did, I did have that ability to connect with people. And I, you know, so like, just because someone was into sports or not into music or something like that, that was never like a deal breaker for me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, if somebody one on one is chill, like everybody's cool to me, like for real. Um, so I don't think I had a big social issue like that. And I had friends and I had my crew of friends. Um, but I do think by like junior year, sophomore year at some point, like I was just firmly checked out of like the high school experience altogether. Why? Um, I just because I was just all about everything happening outside. You know, I mm. was I didn't I wasn't involved in any clubs. I wasn't involved in any sports. Basically, I went to work after school. And then had band practice or went to shows or, like, was on the phone trying to book shows. Like, Well, let's go into that like, because I want to see how you started that whole path. Because you had said earlier as well, like, by the time you got in your junior or senior year, you wanted to kind of check out. Like, when was your, like, first punk show? Where was that at? Especially because a lot of people listening to this, the majority of them were – like from Jersey or, or live in Jersey or from Jersey. So we all get it. So I want to really right. like, yeah, yeah, I want to yeah, open, yeah. even if you're, even anyone listening, you're not from Jersey. Like this is where like I started this to geek out because I remember all this shit. And I want to just go back and be like, you know, where was it and talk about it. So people are like, man, that place was fucking awesome. Well, and it is a cool, unique thing, isn't it? Cause like, you know, New Jersey doesn't, we don't really have cities. Anybody gives a fuck about, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, there was never like this, cbgb's of new jersey or like a gilman street of new jersey you know yeah like it was the like way in a firehouse or something yeah it was yeah it was birthed out of uh altruistic parents who are willing to give up their basements <laughs> and you know uh dumb enough knights of columbus's and elks lodge and fire halls that were willing to take that on yeah um so i mean point. literally all of my first shows were like basement shows in Bridgewater, Hillsboro, Raritan, Somerville, like just Somerset County, like at people's houses. Um, Do you know how old you were when you went to your first show? Yeah, I, was, I think I was 12. Wow. Like, when I actually went to that first, like, and, uh, you know, the bands around at the time were hugely important to me, still are, you know, bands like One Nature and Shabagoy and Shades Apart, um, Vision, you know, all these bands were like, really local right from my area yeah. um some of them even went to the same high school i went to just you know before me uh and that scene was there you know it was like it, it wasn't like i uh came in and like created it like it was there yep. uh, waiting for me when i found it um and you know i kind of came in in that interesting transition when the whole scene was kind of converting almost, especially the hardcore scene from like sort of the negative tough guy, New York style scene to a much more positive, you know, like the youth crew kind of scene was starting to come in. And then, you know, so whatever, that's, that's a whole nother conversation about <laughs> the, uh, the subtle divisions in a local hardcore. I mean, I remember a buddy of mine, he played in, uh, Uprise. Do you remember that hardcore band? Yeah. Matt yes. Molnar? No, it was, uh, Mike Ziobro. He, they, Uprise okay. was already a band. Mike came in and played guitar. There's a lot of episodes where I talk, cause I grew up in Jefferson and Mike went. So there. you know all about the Morris County youth crew then? You know, I, I know about them. Uh, it wasn't in my face, but Mike, I believe, was a part of it, and he was super straight edge vegan. Yeah, uh, back pretty then. sure to be an uprise, you had to be MCYC. That was, that was yeah part of the deal. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember we played a show at uh, uh, Boot and Elks Lodge, and uprise yeah. kids came in at the end, and that was the first time I saw forty kids in sync doing a floor punch. Uh, right, in the right, breakdown. right. Yeah. So I think, but that was around the time where we started to diminish a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, 
but then also like I always and you know you do a podcast you talk to tons of people like there's always like that chicken or the egg thing for me whether Hmm. things are diminishing or I'm just getting old and I have no idea what's happening um (laughs) which is very possible. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) I hate listening to people in like their late thirties, early forties, self-righteously talking about the time they had and how much better it was and how it doesn't exist anymore. Like seriously, how the fuck do you know? Um, You know, actually real quick on that note, I listened to there's lead singer syndrome. It's the guy, Shane. Oh yeah. Shane. Yeah. Shane's podcast. Yeah. Yeah, It's fantastic. And he's interviewing Cove from Seosin and they're talking about it, but they're talking about their scene and it's like, and Cove is going on kind of like, like you said, it's that, Oh man, but back in our scene, that was the time. And I'm going, well, fuck, dude, that's a scene I couldn't fucking stand. No, I mean, I, <laughs> right. I, I ended up liking a lot of bands in that era from like 2004 on. But that was around the time, like prior to that, I'm like, no, man, it was our fucking time. But then yeah. prior to that, anyone, all the old school Liberty Spike guys would come to shows. They're like, well, fuck you. It's like the 80s. Yeah. You know, there's always totally. that pocket that does that shit. And you're like, I know. I, I right. always like remember the feeling I had when I was like 15 getting yelled at by some Chromax dude for liking Snapcase. Yeah. You know, being like, hey, that's not fucking hardcore, man. I'm like, well, why not? Like, I don't care, <laughs> you know? And, you know, I had that... I actually had that... Uh, it was a very good experience for me. I was on a warp tour in, like, 08 with Gaslight early on. And it was, like, at the height of, you know, emo core and the Christian metal core and, like... You know, these bands that I I didn't even know existed, you know, two months before literally drawing like, fuck, I mean, 3000 kids, 12 in the afternoon, you know, like just these huge bands. And, you know, on that tour, I was in this little group with like, it was like Gaslight against me, the street dogs, the bouncing souls, like the old dudes, you know, like the old punk rock dudes were all hanging out with each other being negative and. You know, and I'm sitting there thinking, I'm listening to one of these conversations one day. I'm like, you know what? Like the Devil Wears Prada played to more people today than all five of us combined. (laughs) Like, like they're doing something that just like really turns people on for whatever fucking reason. And like, do you I don't want to be the Chromax guy. You know, I don't want to be that dude. I don't want to be the guy. And it's kind of the same thing I was talking about earlier is like I view I view this music as really important to people and I kind of also view us all on the same team. You know what I mean? Like, like if you're listening to devil Wears Prada and you have funny hair and you're really digging it at work tour and you're listening to no effects and have funny hair and you're digging it at work tour, like to the outside world, you're the same. Yeah. You're the same fucking reject kid. So like, we're all on the same team at work tour, you know, like there's shouldn't be like, I don't like that stuff, you know? Um, I mean, that's, yeah, there's always like some kind of competition. I think that one of the things they had said that they were talking about when they played the stage that used to be the drive through stage and it became, uh, whatever it was like, uh, apps some punk i fucking forget the name of it but they were like yeah it was so cool because we were playing and you know the one stage it's like the, the souls or these bigger bands and we're taking no one's there to see them they're all coming to our smaller stage so they were talking about that competition thing and they thought yeah that. they were like oh if this was we sure. were taking over we were showing people that and you're like yeah Man. yeah and they're right and that's where it's like you know like it all just goes in waves and if you're so concerned with what other people are doing it's probably fucking up your own stuff anyway you know what i mean like, oh yeah then it becomes like competitive it, and that exactly that, it kills it that's why i think yeah then the the whole vision is completely gone yeah it just comes from the wrong place but anyway like so so that i mean i don't know how we got off of there but that was kind of the <laughs> we're gonna go off in ra- very man yeah, r- yeah random it's fine to me. Um, <laughs> but yeah like so so really it was those basement shows and stuff that got me started and then You know, it kind of worked the same way for years. It was almost like doing shows was always sort of an outlet for my band to have a show. Um, That's kind of how it started, you know? Like, Mm. the first show I ever booked was at my guitar player's house. I was in a band called Dilemma. And basically, I really wanted us to play a show. And I just started asking, like, what would be bands I could play and could we do it? And it sort of happened. And... um. 
and then I kind of had the confidence. I had a lot of, uh, a lot of space, you know, as a kid to kind of like, you know, at that point, like my brother, my sister, my father, they were all kind of gone. It was just sort of me and my mom in this apartment. And, uh, like, you know, I, I don't know. I just had a lot of time too. And I was really invested and stoked on it. I think I was always someone that maybe like had a hard time knowing where they fit in, like socially, you know what I mean? Even though I was friendly with people, I always, I even still do. I always feel like I'm on the outside looking in of whatever I do. So, I mean, I even think that part of it was acceptance, you know what I mean? Part of it was just like wanting to feel cool and wanting to feel part of something too, if I'm honest about it, you know? Um, and then I randomly like stumbled upon the Manville Elks. Like I had done, you know, a couple basement shows. I had done a show at a firehouse in Bradley Gardens that the aforementioned kid I was talking about before, Steve Lawson, my best friend, jumped onto the roof and actually was the reason we couldn't do any more shows there. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> it was awesome, though. I mean, it was literally my first real show was like Strength 691 and H2O and a bunch of other bands and my band at this Jeez. firehouse. And like a couple hundred people were there, like, all the bands got paid like tons of money. I just rented a couple like speakers from pianos plus on 22. Like it wasn't that hard. And like, and I got really excited about it. And, um, years before I had seen a shades apart show at Manville Elks, like maybe in like 92 or 93, I remember seeing a show there. So I randomly reached out and as it turned out, um, there were two brothers that were, you know, semi younger guys at the time, probably in their thirties. Uh, their last name was Shields. It was Dan and Kevin Shields. Okay. And we actually had a random family history. Their family had owned a gymnastics place on route 206 in Hillsboro that all me and my brother and my sister had gone to when we were kids. So, <laughs> Their parents had owned a gymnastics studio, apparently, that we had gone to. (laughs) And then in in, in in our in a twist of fate, they were like the only two Elks members and like the history of Elks members who were punk rockers. Wow. They they were um, in a band in the 80s called Detention, who I didn't know until I met them. But when I talked to the older kids, they're like, holy shit, Detention. And. It turned out that they were like a punk band that played at City Gardens with the Ramones and Suicidal Tendencies and Jesus. had a couple, you know, songs and stuff that were pretty big in that scene. And so I happened to run into a couple guys who were pretty sympathetic to what we were doing. And, you know, if it wasn't for those dudes, I really wouldn't have done it so long because, I mean, there was many, many times in that uh, situation where I came up short with money uh, where a bunch of the other Elks members, you know, did not want what was going on there. I mean, for some context for people who are listening, I did these shows in a town called Manville, um, which, excuse me to anybody who may be listening from Manville, <laughs> you'd probably admit it. It's a super white trash fucking town. <laughs> um, and some of my good friends are from this town and they would tell you the exact same thing. So that's why I'm. I feel safe saying this. The the quick history of Manville was that it was it was a giant factory town, Polish immigrants who uh, created they, they did insulation at the Johns Manville factory. And at some point, the insulation was toxic. It was like gave a large portion of the town mesothelioma and the factory got hit and then the town went to shit. And it Jesus. turned into this like real working class you know, semi-racist at times, you know, white town. Uh, And, you know, I'm literally like a 14-year-old, 15-year-old, like chubby Jewish kid. Um, My parents are both like, you know, born and bred New Yorkers, like not about any of that shit, you know. Uh, (laughs) You know, I have like five earrings in my left ear. I'm like super friendly, long hair, like just you know, everything that's antithetical to their experience was walking in the door, but I don't know. I think these guys like me too. I was like, I was ballsy. I didn't, you know, I didn't let anybody give me shit. And, you know, I think they respected someone so young trying to do something 
legitimate, you know, not just be a fucking idiot. So. And you were how I old had, at this point? When I started doing Man- Manville shows regularly, I was 15. Okay. I mean, you yeah. got to think about it from any aspect. Adults typically can't stand teenagers. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, I can't fucking stand teenagers. I'm sure. only 30. So annoying. Right? Yeah. yeah so I mean, annoying. you're like, yeah. oh, they fucking know everything. But, oh yeah, my brother is a high school English teacher right now. Oh, he tells God. me all about it. Yeah. yeah, fuck that. I mean, <laughs> but you gotta think about it. You, you, this kid who comes in. How were you tall? Like, a, were you like a tall kid back then, or you said you were shorter? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was probably still like close to six feet at that time. I'd say. Yeah. So you got like this six foot tall, fifteen year old kid coming in there and like taking charge. And there's something about that. I think. That, you know, I, and I know the Elks Lodge, the Elk Lodge crowd. I remember the guys who were running it, who were, you know, they didn't own it, but they were the ones who were heading it up. And then the dudes and the women who would sit at the bar, if there sure. was a bar, and like, they were all salty characters, but... Yeah, 50 cent beers, if you remember, man. It was, no, was, it really? was awesome. God, yeah. I never, I never <laughs> drank at shows back then, because I was, I always looked so young. But you well, got to think couldn't. like you had you had to be an Elks member. Oh, oh. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That was that was the catch. D- wait, are you friends with Pelak? Mike Pelak? Yeah, yeah, sure. So Pelak, I in his interview, I was like, dude, I was like if I lived in Jersey, I would pick random Saturdays and go to these places and sit at the bars and have a beer. He's like he's like, "You know oh, what, yeah. dude?" He's like, "I think I'm going to start doing that." I'm like, "You should totally <laughs> fucking should." Especially now he's like Pelak. probably like a member of Manville now, and be like, "50 cents beers." Fuck. Yeah. Well, Pelak's a vet though, you know, so he has that thing. He could just go and oh, be like, that's yeah, I'm true. A, he'd be like, "Yeah, I'm a veteran." And then they'll just be super cool to him, you know. Yeah, watch that. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. They're like, "Weren't you in the uh, Mike Kemp video and the uh, the yeah, Right. 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 But you got to think like you're that you're coming and taking charge, and these guys probably had to respect that. Like, all right. Yeah, dude. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, and again, like, uh, I was really, I was a nice kid, man. You know, I definitely didn't come in there with any attitude. All pleases and thank yous, and me and my crew always made sure like the place looked exactly the same when we left. You know, there is, you know, those guys were cool, but we were also a responsible group of kids. Um, But what was interesting, you know, then it was just so more communal based because, you know, there was some tough shows like there was tough people going to shows at that time. I mean, I guess there still is. And and there was a lot of fights at shows and there was issues and we had so little problems there. And so much of it was just because, like, I was willing to go on the mic and kind of I would Mm. like every show pretty much at some point in the show, even though terrified because I hate standing up on stage. Uh I would like go up on the mic and just explain the deal. I'd be like, Hey, like it's basically like me and a couple of my friends doing this whole thing. Like if there's fights, if you guys fuck this place up, it's done. So try not to do that. If you like the shows here and I remember that. and if you have time after pick up a fucking broom and help me clean up a little, and then we can keep this place going forever. You know, like, yeah, that was kind of my vibe and it actually worked in hindsight. You know, so much of the problems I avoided was just by being straight and honest with people and and asking for what I needed, you know? Yeah. There's a couple bands I knew I couldn't book, like uh, that band Fury of Five wanted to beat me up once because <laughs> they wanted to get in a show and I kind of told them, like, not the whole band, there's just one guy from the band was upset. And I was like, guys, I'm like... And again, I was just honest. I'm like, listen, like you're a bunch of dicks. I'm like, you, I'm like, you, I'm like, you know who comes to your shows. I'm like, I don't bring them. I'm like, I just can't deal with those guys. Like they're they're men. They're scary. I'm like, I can't. I'm like, they do. I've seen them do terrifying things. I can't book you guys, you know. And the one guy got really mad, and the other guy from the band ended up pulling me aside and being like, dude, I get it. You know, it's cool. Um, <laughs> it sounds like you. I mean, it's it's pretty impressive that. You had a. It sounded like you had a vision. It, it didn't sound like you were gonna do shows for a living, but you just had this vision, and you were very concrete in putting shit together. I think if you asked me at that time, I would have said I'd love to do shows for a living. Hmm. You know, I don't think I knew what I was gonna do, and um, there was definitely a time in my life I was semi obsessed with the idea of being a venue owner in New Brunswick, like. Like still time, idea. man. There's still time. You oh, bring it back. I mean, the, the longer and longer I go and the more and more I learn about what it takes to operate a venue, yeah. the less and less I want to do it, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, no, I mean, I was real. I even still miss it sometimes, you know, like, um, and periodically I'll put together some, you know, I had a, I have a hardcore band. I do some stuff with it. I did put together a show for us last year. It still feels good. You know? Wow. That's awesome. Um, was it, was it at a club though? Or it was at a really weird place like this, uh, kind of half biker bar social club that was doing stuff in Jersey city for a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. yeah. Yeah, it was cool. Um, <laughs> You know, when it was happening, I, I don't think, you know, I was just in it and I didn't realize it was special, you know, or it was anything unique at all. Um, you know, now in retrospect, like, it's so, I'm so stoked about all of it. You know what I mean? Like, what a crazy, crazy thing to get to do and, yeah. and be involved with for so long, you know? I just had a lot of really cool, supportive people, too, who, like, you know, helped me. Like, I didn't even have a fucking license, so... Uh, you know, to imagine, like, I relied on a lot of people, you know, for rides and for all sorts of different things in that time. So, you know, I don't want that to be forgotten. Even my mom, you know, I would put my mom's number was on the flyer. And, you know, this was before the Internet. So the day of the show, about 100 people would call your house asking for directions. It's not like the Manville Elks Lodge was a well-known place. So I basically would write down written directions from all four directions you know from mm. philly new york from oh, the God, south from the west yeah leave them with my mom and then my mom would answer the phone the day of a show she'd sit there and give people directions so people for um, see like a lot of people listening they are the demographic from that era but i think if anyone catches on to this podcast that's younger i mean you know not to sound like old man back in the day but that's how it was it was from my perspective of going to a show like i was we always played like majority of the time we were playing i would just get in the van and then like my drummer sean he would drive and i'd show up i was like all right cool like that's on him i'm here it wasn't right you know, i'd figure out but then i'd go to shows and i mean i don't even really remember back then i think we'd have the flyer in the car and there was no iphone with a map and if you had a right, map it yeah. was literally a physical map and you kind of you kind of trace your finger like all right I got to take 287 down we got to break off on 202 and that's going to lead to 206 and then this says yeah. we got to make a left and there'll be something on the side of the road and if right. you hit this fireworks yeah, a, thing a you've gone too far on the right, yeah SDS tire on the left go two more lights yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah, then there were the fancy it. kids though who had the two sided flyers you know who had yep the flyer on one side with the directions on the back but i couldn't afford the two sided. those were <laughs> those were some pimp that was pimp stuff i remember the man looks like too because that and the, the best thing the when you knew you were there it's almost like when you were a little kid you knew where all the your friends were because all the bikes were piled up in front of someone's house <laughs> right yeah. it was just because all the kids were hanging outside that was the oh this is it you know you just yeah, look yeah, over yeah. and you see the girls were wearing like the the baby doll punk tees and you know and have like the yeah, yeah. all the hot topic gear on or whatever and the guys had super baggy pants and like extra large shirts even though they weighed 130 pounds and... oh the huge pants remember man. that shit like yeah we were talking oh, about I, had him. I had them i mean i was chubby too so i was looking for any excuse to hide what was under there so i the whole giant fashion of the 90s real worked really well for me for a while it was perfect wait perfect the old fat boy fashion oh yeah actually you cut out there for a second the old what bashing oh uh, just like the giant giant clothing uh trend of the 90s oh really yeah. worked out well for a fat kid kind of you know like it was perfect yeah and then <laughs> uh then when like 2004 or 5 came around it was just we wear everything that's five sizes too small and you're like Fuck. oh yeah i like, know my my you know, to to her credit, I would probably still look like some version of that if it wasn't for my wife. <laughs> um, I would probably still be in like fairly oversized skate jeans and like, yeah, yeah. She made me look a lot cooler than I used to. For sure. <laughs> I mean, Gotta give yeah. her, give her credit on that. <laughs> what um, what was like one of the craziest shows you put on? It was Man Manville was like your only venue though, like that's where you stayed before. We'll talk about you transferring that over to Ricky, but like that was your main spot, right? Yeah, yeah, that was my main spot for sure. Like I had done some stuff at like the Melody Bar afterwards, but yeah, Manville is definitely like the lion, the lion share of my thing for sure. Oh, uh, what's funny stories that come to mind? Like 
Uh, I remember doing one show. It was a Murphy's Law show. Murphy's Law was like two songs in, and, and I was at the front uh, table, like counting counting the money for the show, getting ready to leave and stuff. And all of a sudden, like music stopped for kind of like too long, and I'm like, uh oh, is like something weird going on in there? Like, you know, do I have to jump in? Like, we're having sound problems, something. And all of a sudden, uh, Jimmy G just runs past me, kind of shrugs his shoulders, like whoop, and then just I hear vomiting in the bathroom and just like pops out like 20 seconds later with just like a little smirk it's like all right good to go and then just ran right past back me and completed the show <laughs> that was pretty badass That's um, great. it was some other fun stuff we you know we had some tricky stuff like there was a show one of the benefit shows we did for my boy matt um uh my best friend matt levitin this should definitely be talked about if we're talking about Manville so much. I did yeah. Manville shows with my best friend, Matt Levitin. Um, and shortly after he moved to South Carolina, he was living with the Stretch Armstrong guys and stuff down there. He got in a major car accident and was paralyzed. Oh, um, and actually still is to this day. Uh, and, you know, Matt was like, half of manville he was you know he did half the shows he did a lot of the he was really into like the more tough guy stuff than i was so those were more his shows and uh but when he got hurt you know the community really came together and did a bunch of benefit shows for him um and at one of those shows not mine it was like the second series of them a couple like proper like nazi skinheads like showed up to the show like three of them uh and I had booked bands on that show that had drawn sort of the real proper, like, New Jersey hardcore kids. Yeah. Who, you know, even though they used to beat people up and do a lot of shitty stuff themselves, they were, you know, you know, violently anti-racist. Like, that was part of it, you know? Yeah. Um, so these kids showed up. I kind of, you know, panicked a little when they were at the door and I let them in. And, you know, I see, like, just right off the bat, like, you know, almost like a school dance, like, like the record stopped, like everyone in the room saw him. People start talking and I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, like, this is going to be bad. And I end up, like, asking one of them to, like, talk to me in the hallway, you know, and I had already dealt with stuff with, like, some skinheads and Nazis and I had put it in, like, a decent place in my head and... I was basically like, hey, like, you guys are about to get fucking worked, like straight up worked. I'm like, I'm like, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm like, these dudes are no joke. Like, I'm like, I'm like, but you you really need to get the fuck out of here. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they were kind of resisting and, and talking, talking a little shit to me. And then, you know, out of nowhere, like the troops assemble, you know, you literally saw like. I don't know. I mean, in my head, it looks like the Warriors, you know, because uh, <laughs> yeah. cause it's a story from my past, you know, so in the head, I picture, yeah, it's a real gnarly shit, but it was probably like, you know, a group of like 10 to 20, like proper tough, you know, hardcore kids were like assembling and, you know, these kids saw it and they're like, all right, we're leaving. And they start walking out and there's basically three of these kids walking and like 25 of these dudes just following really closely behind um and one of them decided to turn around and say something for a second just got punched like immediately uh and they ended up running across the street to somebody's house that they knew and calling the police and sitting on a porch with like 30 hardcore kids on the other side of the street waiting Jesus. um and the cops ended up coming and you know of course protecting the skinheads as that's still a theme, I think, in yeah. policing. But yeah, again, another uh, the freedom podcast. of speech. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was an interesting one. Um, yeah, so I mean, a lot of stuff like that, just like like a lot of big things. Um, another person who should get credit is John Hiltz. I don't know. He was the drummer mm -hmm. in like Born Against. Um, okay. He's a very sort of well-known New Jersey punk rock guy and. He had done my, uh, he had done most of the sound for me there. And that guy's a punk rocker through and through. And 
towards the end, they tried to kind of get me out of the venue. They didn't want the shows anymore. And they started making me sign contracts. But, you know, I wasn't old enough to do a valid contract. And this guy, my sound guy, used to sign off on these contracts, basically taking the liability for the entire show. Wow. Um, which, again, like saved my ass for another like year, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was a, a lot of, you know. I, I feel like I just found a flyer today to you from like my 16th birthday show. And like my brain is swimming with memories, you know, but That's awesome. there's just like hundreds of like good bad ones, scary ones, you know, what was um, like something that learning experience. What was, you know? what was one thing that would be, I wrote it down as constantly went wrong. Uh, I know when we would play a shows, there was always the thing that was the biggest thing I would always fear. Uh, a lot of times, an amp would just crap out for no reason, or right, right. we'd be playing and we would make sure we didn't drop our picks or something like that because that was the fucking worst. Like little things. Like what was what was something that was that fuck that's happened again when you would put shows on? I mean, what was the stuff I'd have to deal with? You know, this was like way before ticket sales. So, you know, you'd always have the people trying to, you know, lick their hands and try to copy my stamp and get in for free. Yeah, that was a recurring, a recurring problem I had. Um, <laughs> you know, fights and stuff weren't too bad there, uh, luckily, because that that definitely closed down a lot of venues at that time. Um, my sound problems were fixed early. I, I had done uh, a show. It was actually the first records tour. And it was Harvest, Despair, and Brothers Keeper. And I had booked these two bands from Pennsylvania on it, one called Abnegation, another called Puritan, who were sort of hardcore, like, straight-edge vegan bands. Um, okay. And uh, this band, Pur- uh, uh, just for so the guys who were doing, do you remember the band E-Town Concrete? Oh, yeah. So Anthony and Kenny from E-Town Concrete were my first sound guys. Oh, shit. Um, so they had a small system, and they brought it. It was the second show they had ever done for me. And this band Puritan gets up, and, you know, they're a very over-the-top kind of hardcore band. And uh, the guy gets up, he's just like, hey, what's up? Yeah! And just breaks a mic, like smashes it on the ground. And then oh, literally within the set, he broke another one. So basically... This straight edge vegan band broke two of E Town Concrete's microphones. Um, oh, and at the time, Anthony from E Town was only like a year older than me. I was like 16, he was 17, but he was like a man already and he was terrifying. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, they like, they ended up coming to me after the show. I gave them the money that they agreed upon, but the show did not do well. And he came up to me after and, like, pressed me for money about the microphones. And I was like, bro, there's no money. Like, I don't know what to tell you. I'm like, I didn't do it. In retrospect, he was right. You know, it is on the promoter. So, you know, I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. Uh, And and then he got pretty chesty with me and basically was like, yeah, I'm going to, like, maybe punch you a couple (laughs) times if you don't give me the money. (laughs) And I ended up, like carting my ass like i had to like beg my mother for her her uh, bank card and get her to come and like go to a fucking quick check and pull out like 60 bucks for these guys like just total mess um but it, that was like the impetus for getting john hiltz as my sound guy <laughs> so <laughs> e-town that was the last show i did with e-town as my sound guys so anyone listening, uh, we I was talking to Benny and we came up to an hour on our on right up until this point in the podcast and uh, we had to kind of break to do some stuff so we ended up scheduling it for a week later which we are now so that's just uh, where we're at right now you might notice a little bit difference in my voice because I've developed a sl- slight cold so if you're listening for an hour it might have I might have sounded slightly different so that's the difference that's all I wanted to state. And now we're going to jump back into it. And Benny just let me know that he had something he wanted to add. Well, you sound you sound bassier. You sound more bossa nova. It's nice. <laughs> a more soulful podcast you have now. Welcome to the easy is, listenings of uh, yeah, New Jersey. There you go. Band. There we go. Maybe this is a new direction for you. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was listening. I was listening to a podcast. I'm afraid to tell you. Um, oh, a, a competitor's podcast. Wait, there who's this? Other, 
there are other people who have them. Wait, uh, which Mal- the uh, the author uh, Malcolm Gladwell? Okay, has a, he's got a really cool podcast called Revisionist History, okay. um, and it basically takes like little points in history that were potentially like uh, uh, misunderstood or reported inaccurately, and he kind of like digs into them, and it's a really cool podcast. And he had one. Uh, about memory and specifically Brian Williams. You remember the the uh, NBC reporter? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Who uh, who who sort of falsely said he was like shot down in a helicopter in Iraq, and then like it later came out that he was in Iraq at the time, but not you know in in any fire. He his helicopter never went down. Like you know yeah. some weird stuff like that, and. Uh, you know, he was basically shamed publicly after a very clean career. And, you know, you haven't really heard from him since, right? Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't think he's around. He's been kind of blackballed. And this podcast was about the idea that as time goes on and you get further away from your memories, your your contextual inferences about the world mixed with the way you would like to feel while telling the story starts to naturally adapt the memory in a way that's out of your control. So, so the further you get away from a memory, um, if the intent is not there to lie, then you are actually like, it's literally your brain playing tricks on you. Like the farther away you get from something, you start to fill in the gaps with things that would naturally make sense to you or like, or put uh-huh. the situation back in context. So I listened to this podcast. I found it really interesting. It kind of made me feel bad for Brian Williams because <laughs> everything he said was kind of like, basically that was like, my intent wasn't to lie. I just kept telling and retelling the story for so long and, in in that coupled with feeding my own ego, it just wound up in this place, and I never really like meant for it to. And I kind of believed him after listening to this podcast. Yeah. So then followed a short period of some self reflection, and yours was the last interview or podcast I'd done. And there's a couple stories that I'm like, wait a minute, like <laughs> this is a long fucking time ago, <laughs> and like how much of this is true like Mm. definitely true you know how much is like because i like to tell stories i've probably told these stories to people before so the idea that the story is exactly the same as it was 15 20 years ago when it happened is maybe naive to think now yeah so so basically i wanted to start this podcast by saying all of this might not be true (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I want to put it out there that my intent is to tell you the truth. I like to be truthful. I don't like to be, I don't like liars committed to truthfulness, but apparently <laughs> my brain may be playing tricks on me. So, so Manville so, isn't a piece of shit. <laughs> no, Manville's a piece of shit. This is for sure. You know what? Oh, I feel, I, I'll be I honest. bad saying that. Is you, you that know, what it, did, did I say it that bad? No, like, no. I mean, you, piece of shit. I think you kind of danced around it. I, I did. I will say though, in the week of self reflection that you're talking about, uh, I thought about that statement that you made, and I'm thinking a lot of other people that I talk to, majority of them, I'd say like all of them are are not really doing anything with music. Like the first part of this, the first season was all about, you know, a lot of those people. I think the only person still doing music is like Tom, and then Chris Badami is still doing Portrait. Oh yeah. Um, so I think they would say things that, I, and I, I have noticed with certain people that are kind of still doing it, they're a little bit reserved in what they say, and the ones who have nothing to lose, they're like, I don't give a shit. And I thought about that statement you made, and I'm like, I wonder if that would have backlash towards you because you, you know, obviously you've got spotlight on you for words. Wait, the the statement I made about Manville being yeah. kind of white trash. Yeah, and I was like, uh, yeah. should, I, should I like, should I like call like say like, hey, no, you, you know what, I can out? I can safely sort of, I, it's fine. 
Okay. Honestly, I, it's I fine. just I've I never like, had to like really be aware. I mean, for yeah, me, yeah, like, like on the off real. chance that there's someone from Manville who cares about Manville <laughs> enough to listen to that story and actually contest like what I was saying. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> like, I think most people from Manville would sort of like yeah, safely and almost proudly say they're kind of white trash in a way. Um, <laughs> So, and being that I'm like from about a mile away yeah. and consider myself some version of white trash, uh, it's almost like me making a Jew joke. Like, I feel like I'm kind of allowed. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I so, yeah, no. So, yeah, um, I just thought about it for about 30 seconds and I'm fine with that comment. It's okay. <laughs> 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 I love how you, it was funny when you said a competitor of mine. It's like it'd be like me saying. I mean, I don't think anyone in music is a competitor of anyone, but it's like, oh, I, I talked to another person in a band. They played. Yeah. Uh, they played jazz music. <laughs> well, I, that was that was the joke I was making. There's a couple podcasts out there in the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so yeah, but the one story, the one story that I was like really wondering about was how bad that situation was with the guys from E-Town Concrete doing sound for me. Yeah. They did like this definitely happened. The things that definitely happened are this. The show definitely happened. Uh, the show definitely didn't make enough money. That definitely happened. The band Puritan definitely played and the band Puritan definitely broke a microphone. Then I definitely had to come up with money for those guys for sure. Because that money went away. But how, like, aggressively they, like, went after me for it, what the exchange was like, and how I got the money, I don't know. That could all be gray. That could... (laughs) Like I'll 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 safely put all of that into question. Well, I could see it's like a game of telephone, right? Even if you're in the present, exactly. you're 20 people away from your starting point of you telling a secret, and within that 20 seconds, it it goes around the room or whatever, and gets back to you, and it's all wrong. Yes, I think yes. that t- two decades of where we were and now, it's you basically playing a game of telephone with yourself. Yeah, so that's exactly what it is. It's and then and the thing that. Uh, you know, the um, people who studied memory on this podcast said was, you know, once you play telephone, the gaps get larger. And then that's when you're a different part of your brain kicks in that fills in those gaps with things that just make sense. Mm-hmm. Things that like, you know, would be like, oh, that would make sense if that would happen. So that's how you fill in the gap. But it's not necessarily what happened or how it happened interesting yeah pretty cool so So, everyone listening everything from this point on is void (laughs) well kind of everything is void with this in mind you know what i mean this is where you made me rethink my life right now benny yeah i mean we should you should rethink all elements of reality with things like this in mind the podcast is over thank you (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, no. No, or did you just you put your head in a tub or something you yeah i just know? yeah i'm like just uh, I'm, I'm turning Jesus. my oven on right now as we speak so i can just throw too my much <laughs> i'm sorry i'm not into small talk i bum people out all the time i love it dude this. i hate small talk i yeah yeah I, so I i always try to find some random bigger thing to talk about with someone who was sure. in an elevator and they're like wow you didn't ask me about the fucking weather i'm like who cares yeah we both know how the weather is yeah we were we're going outside. We'll figure it out. So yeah. okay, to go on that path though of the things that you're you can slightly remember, and I'm sure. interested in which which way I want to go with these questions now because uh, I mean if you still want to answer them with knowing oh, that you I'll, might be listen, having a false. Uh, this is what I'm saying. I, I'm not going to hold myself back from telling stories. I'm just now uh, <laughs> informing you off the bat that. All you can judge now is intent, okay? Hmm. And my intent is to tell the truth. I like it. <laughs> so I like it. But like, unless you, I had like a home stenographer on my shoulder or something. There's just no way to prove it, you know. So it's before the iPhone, people didn't take pictures. Of everything, I don't know. The question I let in to the E Town thing uh, was like, what things constantly went wrong? So you went into that direction, and you said after that, that's when John Hilt became your sound guy. 
Yeah. Um, and this is like a really short, I mean, I really feel like those guys did like two shows for me, maybe. And then literally the rest of Manville, like throughout all of it was all like all John. If John couldn't do it, I didn't even do the show. I didn't like. Why? Get... What, was, what was it about John that like you liked? Well, I thought it was cool. I mean, obviously you were at a lot of venues in those days. Like one of the cool things about Manville is it sounded good. You know, like like it wasn't walking into some nights of Columbus where like all you heard was somebody's PV 5150 and everything else is just like a mess. Yeah. And, you know, the experience of the show is there. But like, you know, that was an issue with hall shows. It always was. Um, So the idea that like I found someone that was doing like an awesome job. And who was really, like, from the start, just down for, like, what was going on. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. John's, like, a proper fucking punk rocker. Like, that dude is legit. You know what I mean? Um, and I think he's just, he's just into something cool and independent going on and wants to help that instinctually, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think he found himself in that place with, like, we were talking about just some you know, chubby, you know, crazy kid going at this shit, and he was into it, you know? Um, was he the same age as you? Because you were, at this time, No, you were still no, no, like, way older. older. Okay, because you were, yeah, at this yeah. point, and again, you know, even though people listening, it's, like, minutes between, I probably talked about this, but it's been a week. Um, you were, at this time, you were 15? Uh, when, when Manville is in, like, full swing, where, like, the bigger shows are happening, closer to, like, 16 or 17. It was, like, okay. junior and senior year of high school, um, probably. Did you, yeah. do, did you do the Houseboy show? Mm, I don't know. It doesn't ring a bell. Okay. But that could have been, like, Matt's or Ricky's. That You know, there was some stuff that, that wasn't always mine. But that one wasn't. Okay, because... Yeah, I'm trying to think of the shows that we played there. It was Houseboy and this other band they were on tour with. But the other main um, one I remember was the uh, Broadway's Tuesday show. But that you said that was Ricky's. That was a Ricky show, yeah, definitely. Okay. There's like jazz in the background right now? What is that? Yeah, I, uh, I'm i actually at my drum space in Jersey City. Oh, cool. Which is in the, uh, the basement of this building. And two floors above me is a rehearsal studio. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's someone ripping some sweet licks <laughs> up there. <laughs> so yeah, uh, John was, yeah, John was like, um, he was the drummer in born against, Yeah. uh, you know, who was their prime was in the, I'd say late eighties, early nineties, I guess. Um, but it was before my time when they were going. So like, that was also probably when it, like, I thought it was cool. Like, you know, John is a cool dude. Like, uh, he was the drummer from Born Against. Um, they used to do shows at their parents' house in, like, Westfield that were, like, these famous, famous shows. Like, some really amazing bands played at their parents' house back in the day. And so, by the time I met him, like, I knew of him, you know, and was, yeah. like, stoked that he was, like, doing my shows and was my friend, you know? Well, it's kind of He's still cool. my friend, actually. He invited me to a pizza party this Saturday. <laughs> That's awesome. Where 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 in where in Jersey is a pizza party? He also lives in Jersey City. Oh oh, so you live in Jersey City? Yep. Oh, mm-hmm. nice. oh cool. Are you in like the um the whole like done up part on like by Grove Street and all that? I am. I am. Oh, yes. Cool. I am. I'm officially a yuppie. <laughs> Um, all right, so Monkey, anyone listening, Monkey, I interviewed him, I think, episode six, and he was the roadie for a lot of bands, but Bigwig got him into his whole roadie phase. Yes. And uh, so he knows Benny, and he actually connected me with Benny, so Monkey, thank you for the connection. Um, Thanks, Monkey. I know Monkey since we were pretty young. Yeah, actually. Pretty young guys. Did you guys go, did he grow up in Somerville? I forget if he said that. No, I think he grew up in the mountains somewhere, um, <laughs> but... Uh, but he was at like all those Manville shows and we yeah. had a lot of like mutual friends through the years. Like I've always known monkey cool dude. Always. I should have, I should probably remember all this since I interviewed him about this, but that was also back in like March. So, well, there was that whole crew that like, I didn't grow up around there, but then you guys had all that, like, like Scotty's and summit and the, uh, quick check in new Providence like this whole scene yeah. going on with the pinball records. Well, we weren't we weren't really like pinball. We were from North 
West Jersey. Oh, yeah, you guys were, yeah. We were like the Jefferson kids, and we hung out with the Wayne kids. And right. we would come down to Bernardsville, and that's where we'd be. That's where the, the pinball crew was. All right, so Monkey said, I said, hey, man, do you have a question for Benny that I should ask? He goes, yeah, you got to ask about the benefit shows he put on at Manville and why Boy Sets, why Boy Sets Fire didn't play. Um, no. I don't know if he will talk about this uh, thing or not. There's some blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read that. Rumors. Um, yeah, so he said, talk about those things. So talk about the benefit shows. And oh, then cool. Yeah, so the, the basic story with the benefit shows was Matt, I think we talked about it a little in the last episode, Matt Levitin, who was like my partner in crime at Manville, um, you know, one of my best friends, uh, he had moved down to South Carolina and shortly after got in a very bad car accident um, and was paralyzed. And, you know, especially at that time, Matt was like a pretty punk rock dude. Didn't really have a, you know, insurance type job. Everything was, was, you know, just they needed money. Um, And, you know, it was our natural response to uh, start putting together benefit shows like uh, and obviously at Manville and you know, everybody at Manville knew Matt and loved him. So it was, you know, everyone was on board. Um, the first set of shows was pretty much like me and Tim Shaw from Ensign pretty much put together, uh, booked the whole things. Um, and it was like a two day festival that packed out the Elks with like a thousand people each day. You know, crazy bands played Vision, Gnostic Front, uh, just I don't know to I name a couple. Did, I think we did talk about this in the other. The yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we we touched on it for sure. Yeah. Um, and that was amazing. It was like like an incredible experience in a lot of ways. Even just thinking about it gets me a little like choky because it was a it was a very uh you know pivotal weekend. Yeah. Um, I could say for just like my life in a lot of ways. Hmm. Um, but. Uh, the boys is fire thing. I won't get too into cause I don't feel like getting into that shit too much, but the quick story is we did another round of benefit shows. They were asked to play, they agreed. And then they asked for money for the show. They were denied. They did not play the show. Um, okay. <laughs> a lot of shit <laughs> swam around that, uh, <laughs> with a lot of different people. Um, you know, like, uh, but I'm going to let other people tell, tell that whole tale. Um, I actually don't even like care enough to get into it. Yeah. It's been so long. So again, yeah. you're, you're going with your intentions. So your intentions to, uh, you know, yeah, you know. my intentions is to stay away from that one. <laughs> this is where, this is where wisdom starts to come into play. See, I told the E-Town story, <laughs> but I know Anthony E-Town now. Like okay. he's cool. We're cool. We know each other. He worked at Ferret for years. Nice dude, family man now. So I'm safe now. Like, Anthony's a cool dude. Kenny, I don't know. I haven't seen that guy in a, ma- a million years. I never saw uh, those guys play. I, I always heard about them, but I never. I just, oh, they were good. Yeah, they were like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like, think, when yeah. Limp Biscuit was getting huge, I was always like, why is this not E-Town Concrete? Interesting. You know? That was always what I thought. Okay. Because I'm like, these guys are actually tough. They're not just like. From yeah. Jacksonville faking it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so when, like, what with you... those colorful Yankees hats? I'll talk shit about that. <laughs> oh, I hate the Yankees. Someone from Florida is wearing like a red, <laughs> cherry red Yankees hat. I'm just, oh, you? Oh, sorry. You I'm just the, initially you offended oh, okay. by just just the the insinuation. Anyway, <laughs> right around this time, is this when you had mentioned that because you were about junior or senior in high school, and that's when you kind of handed. Not handed over, but like talked to Ricky and said, "Hey, you could do your shows here. Like I'm stepping away from this." Yeah, and it wasn't even like I said; it was like sort of just a natural thing. Like Ricky was doing Wayne, and Wayne was fucking killing it. Um, yeah, Ricky was just like naturally kind of a pimp. Like he did it, you know, he did it really well, and he was hooked up with some good bands early on, especially having the connections to like Newfound Glory and Midtown. You know, uh, and, um, yeah, and he started like asking me at times like, oh, is it, you know, are you interested in this show? Like he would get a package. I'd be like, oh, sure. And I'd like book a couple bands on it and we'd sort of do it together. 
And then, you know, he just kept going and going and had a lot of work and a lot of offers and more than like I was really willing to take on at the time. Um, and I think I was starting to maybe focus more on like just playing music too, you yeah. know, like I was really into the bands I was doing. I had started the low end theory by then and I was starting to go on tour. Um, you know, even by my senior year of high school, we started like, you know, the bands I was in started like traveling a little bit. Um, so you know, so then it came to a point where it just got kind of annoying, <laughs> like, mm. like being the go between, uh, you know, like I was sort of just the attache for the Elks Lodge. And then Ricky was doing literally everything else. Like he's booking all the bands, selling all the tickets, promoting. So at one point I just liked Ricky enough and trusted him and thought he was cool that I just told the Elks like, yeah, you can rent to this guy whenever you want. Um he ended up doing the show so well, he probably got it shut down. <laughs> Cause oh, cause like, it's so packed. Yeah, because he just booked like really great bands. But to his credit, um, things just changed around that time. You know, like uh, what year was this you're talking about? So, like late '90s, like '98, okay. '99, like you know. And then his shows probably picked up more so in maybe the early 2000s, but. Um, like there was a difference between when I started doing shows and when Ricky started, there was like a bigger scene. There was more people. It was younger. It was a little safer. Um, and like, yeah, just the size and scope of the whole thing was different, you know? Uh, so, so I probably would have wound up in the same situation if I kept doing it. Like, like I had only started to deal with punk bands and hardcore bands having booking agents and having contracts and having sort sort of the more mainstream stuff where bands were actually interested in, in making this a career and making money. Was that, Which, what was that what was that like to you, by the way? Oh, I was like I was wildly offended by it, but I was huh. also like young and naive and had no idea what the fuck was going on. So at the time, I remember the first one I got, I, the first contract I got was from H2O. Um, and I think they had started to be booked by Stormy or somebody like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like, um, and I got this contract and I mean, fucking probably super standard artist contract. And, uh, and I was like, I was so offended, so offended. I like called Toby. I was like, what the fuck, man? You know, like, no, I probably didn't curse, but I probably said it really nicely. <laughs> let's let's go back to the memory thing again. Uh, and uh, and he's like, no, you didn't, that wasn't meant for you. That's for clubs, like blah, blah, blah. And he was like real apologetic. And me, like an asshole, I like X'd out the whole contracts, like circled the money, like wrote the food and drinks that they were going to get, and then like signed it and sent it back. I was also not 18, so like it didn't yeah. matter anyway, but... Um, so I, when I think about it now in the, in the time, I thought I dealt with it appropriately. Uh, but in <laughs> thinking back on it, you know, um, I, there is definitely an element to a lot of it. Uh, I didn't understand yet at all. Um, because I was a kid who was in high school and lived in my mom's apartment, you know, like, I mean, it's also then, kind of ironic. That's too. a big difference than being in your late twenties and your full time job as a band. And you know, yeah. what I mean, I I get that a lot more. I'd now hope so. And I did. That. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've kind yeah. of you know built a bit of a living I'd off really of it. Really, be a, a lunkhead if I didn't by now. <laughs> it's the irony in that is just absolutely amazing. Just yeah. like you know, because I know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why I have a lot of honestly, I don't forget the kid I was. And I have a lot of space and cushion for kids who I run into who have that kind of thing going on, you know, because I get it. Like, I get where it comes from. And it's almost like a parent trying to tell a kid something about life that they just cannot understand yet, right. you know? Yeah. Um, so you, do, you shouldn't even get into it, you know? The, they're all going to grow out of it themselves. <laughs> yeah. Actually, real quick... Um... I just, this just popped in and it's just so far removed from this, but I kind of make, I don't know, it might plug into it. Um, have you guys ever in re like Gaslight recently, currently, have you guys ever thought of just showing up at a small venue and like playing a local show? Is that like something you guys have ever done or tried to do? Or you're like, um, yeah, we're just down into it's that. Not anything we've done, but I mean, I think in order to do that, 
you know, we'd have to be practicing a bunch or play like is let's like, say you even, were. Let's say I if you even, were. Yeah, like if we were, sure. Like yeah, you know, like uh, that would be a possibility. It's not something you're like opposed to. Have you done but, that uh, though? Like when you guys were like in your groove, did you kind of just do those pop up things and like honestly like, not oh. a lot. Yeah. I, I can't. Yeah, like we're yeah we weren't one of those bands that did stuff like that too much. Huh. Um, yeah, like we did have the opportunities, um, but for a variety of reasons, we were not a band that did stuff like that very much. Huh. When uh, so like. I have like a bunch of questions about the scene still. Um, I do want to kind of like, you know, tap a little bit into Gaslight, like when you guys kind of like where you guys all might have been around that time in that period and how it came together. Hey, this is this is your world, man. Yeah. But I was you like, take take me on a journey here. <laughs> a journey. You might remember more of like the uh, the more closer things in the time without. Uh, uh, what's the word? Without Brian Williams in it. Um, <laughs> right. Right. So. Actually, at that time, um, like, what was? Do you, do you remember like one of the best shows, local shows that you saw that you didn't put on? Oh yeah, yeah, tons. Um, I was just thinking about one the other day because my kid's pediatrician is up this way, uh, <laughs> and I drove by a town called Oradell. Yep. You know, up in North Jersey, and there was some like Unitarian church there that I had seen a show with a veil and chisel and Samuel and the Van Pelt uh, at this church. And like, that was like a big one. That was like one of those like kid perfect shows. Um, a bunch of the shows I saw at like the Down Under in New Brunswick were like super big for me. The bands that were playing that like, you know, I don't know if I've ever felt better in my life than at a Strength 691 show at the Down Under, you know? It's something me and about 30 people in the world could share but uh i <laughs> uh, love that place i love like middlesex county college shows so i was at tons of those um you know when they were really doing those ridiculous like hybrid shows of like bands that made no sense together mm. uh you know i saw like murphy's law and far side on the same show and there was the crazy earth crisis show i mean the most monumental thing that happened in middlesex county college was there was an earth crisis show um, and some of the guys from Ink and Dagger, yep. uh, and some of the dudes from like Ferret Records and, the this, this printing company, TNT, this guy, Jeff, um, you know, had an issue with earth crisis and the way they went about things. <laughs> they weren't into the hardline stuff. Yeah. And they had these vending machines, you know, the Middlesex County college shows were in like the cleared out cafeteria. Yep. Uh, and they had these like vending machines in the back, some of which had like, you know, cold product, sandwiches, yogurts, things like that. Oh, and no. uh, so people started hitting the vending machines and taking out kind of like dairy, you know, and shit like that and chucking it, um, <laughs> which, you know, started turning a lot of heads. And then Sky Jeff ran onto the stage wearing a fur coat, which it turned out this guy was a vegan who was wearing a fake fur coat. Um but ran onto the stage wearing a fur coat and jumped off and like members of the band like took off their gear and chased after him. And it was just like a melee, like, you know, like hundreds of people like just running down the halls, like seeing what the fuck was going on. It kind of wound <laughs> up outside and inside. Um, that was, I had nothing to do with any of it. I was cl just a spectator, but, uh, but that was pretty wild. That was a wild experience. I always, um, I, I don't think I ever was at a show where shit went. I, I feel that I always hear these stories of people telling these crazy stories. And in my life, I don't feel like I've ever been, like maybe just small briefs, like moments. But I always heard about these shows back then. I always heard about Earth Crisis and the stories about how they'd beat the shit out of this one kid for drinking and, you know, the, all this stuff that was you know i don't know if it's true but i mean i heard it and you, yeah you i mean there was never some... saw it yeah i mean i think the violence part of it seemed to be pretty uh pretty localized to the hardcore scene you know yeah. i think a lot of the stuff you were involved with had a different kind of attitude but it's also it's one of the reasons why i was so attracted to the youth crew stuff you know um yeah. I didn't like the violence of like the old New York hardcore scene. I was turned off to it. I was 
a pacifist a kid in that way. I didn't want to see people fighting at shows. I saw the whole thing as as a, more of an attempt of community and unity between fucking freaks than watching these people fight each other. I really didn't like it, you know? Yeah. Um, so when these, like, positive movements came out, even though they were connected with Straight Edge a lot, which wasn't my thing, um, but I was still involved in that scene just because I think I like the energy better, you know? Um, and yeah. And there was like some movement in hardcore at that time to kind of take it back to a different place, you know, um, where, you know, violence and skinheads and, you know, sort of a, a shitty vibe was definitely present and then kind of went away for a while. Yeah. It was in some of the interviews I've done recently, they really brush on that. Like I talked to um, Jeff from Game Face, and sure, yeah. Like they were, and who else was out there in LA? Like, um, like Sergi from Sam I Am. Yeah, and, yeah, they would know all about it. Yeah, actually, that that was it. That those the the podcast that's launching this week is Popeye from Far Side, and he was talking nice. about that. Yeah, and they talk about the scene and how scary it was and where it, how aggressive it was, and you know they were they were like, yeah, this shit was legit. Like people. It was crazy, and I think that is probably one of the reasons why a lot of that disbanded, because there's only so much... You can only be on, like, 11 for so long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and honestly, it's really exclusionary. It Like, yeah. when I think about it now, so much of it was white, macho, middle-class, male shit going on that had no real open door for anybody else you know what i mean um and i think that was its biggest problem for a long time is like and it's and you see it now half the hardcore kids who are into these scenes are fucking they're conservatives and shit like that now like they were never mm. they're never into the movement aspect of it they were never into the to the culture they never into the ethos like they were into the violence they were into the music that, you know, allowed them to fucking transgress their rage in, in interesting ways, you know, and they got to like knock people around and do this shit and found a community that kept them in it long enough. But I don't think they really adopted, you know, what fucking Ian Mackay was talking about or something like that, you know, like they didn't give a shit about something like that. And I think you've seen it play out. I've seen so many of these guys hit their 30s and their 40s and get just normal jobs and slip into fucking shitty white working class mentality. Like, yeah. um, so it was always there. And I think it was one of the reasons that scene had a limited scope, you know, because it was not a welcoming place. You had some women, but it was like you almost had to act like one of the dudes, you know, <laughs> like you had to cover yourself in tattoos and mosh and like act semi tough to even like fit in you know well maybe um, that was the thing because like you think about if you're if you show up i don't know this is just speculation but it's kind of going back on your comment you made before about you're like a dude who likes to have deep conversations right um i grew up the same way like me and my friends we would just go on these rants where it wouldn't be about punk rock it would just be about the world or how we viewed things and like relationships or like connections with people and then it would kind of weave in with music but it would just kind of be this flow and it's like if i showed up to a place and we were just there to just yell like we're not fucking drinking or whatever it was. And again, this is my aspect of it. If that if sure. they were like if they're so upfront about it and so just mad. On the outside of that, when you like you're when you leave the show, it's like what were the those conversations like behind the door? Like were they connecting right. in some way or were they just like, we're just always mad and you're like, well that's probably maybe why it burned out because they're like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. <laughs> like I don't Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. I, I don't know. Well, and again it's speculation because everyone went behind those doors, but it's like that's just kinda how I can feel because people don't want to talk about one sim one specific topic for too long for so long and they're like all right is there anything else we can fucking talk about like i get it you don't eat meat sure i'm not eating meat either but like what else are we gonna yeah. talk about well and everyone needs like you know they and look what happened to the bands you know from those scenes who started to jump out of it like they were crucified at first you know yeah. like like caven you know who decided to be melodic and change the direction you know they maybe they did it in a way that wasn't extremely classy maybe because they sort of just were like yeah we play none of our old stuff anymore <laughs> like we hate it yeah um i can see where that rubs in an interesting way but like um 
you know, it did move in a lot of different directions. Like there's so many different kinds of hardcore now and stuff like that. And like, you know, it used to be small enough that it was kind of lumped together. And now you have so many like sort of specific genres you could even move to that are catered to your style or what kind of politics you like or something like that, you know? Um, so to, that those sort of options maybe didn't exist. And I'm not sure how much of that is due to, you know, like the s- social media and the internet and kind of making these worlds smaller and easier to find, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Not sure. It's got to be some something in that, I'd imagine, you know? Yeah, and I can imagine anyone listening to this, they come and say, well, here's my take on it. I'd be like, okay, I'm totally open to that, you know? I'm not I'm yeah. sure they saw it differently. And I, I, I definitely, I was talking to Adam uh, from Link80, and he, he was talking about how he's like, yeah, I just didn't drink and do drugs. He's like, I kind of just didn't do it until some, someday someone was like, oh, you're straight edge. And he was kind of like, oh, I guess I am. But then he would say, like, you know, we'd go to shows and we'd X up and do that. And he's like, it kind of just made us stand for something and just kind of feel like I was a part of something solid. And I could see where yeah. kids needed that who totally. had a hard time, you know, drinking and things like that. But then they just would go straight off the edge and fall off the edge. <laughs> and get super fucked up. Well, some of them. Some of them still yeah. are. You know, yeah. like I, I know people in there. I know 40 year old straight edge people. You know, like I love, who, I respect the hell out of them who, who still are. But the one thing I noticed is the people who are still straight edge are the ones you probably didn't even know were straight edge then. You know, um, I find that the people who got head and shoulders into the movement and would X up a ton and use it as their identity, um, you know, were maybe more consumed in the identity aspect of it rather than, you know, uh, the actual thing happening. And then the people who were naturally averse to drugs and alcohol who weren't into it, you know, they found a scene that worked for them, but probably were just more comfortable with their decision and yeah. just stuck with it, you know? Like, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I've watched that fall out a lot, you know, <laughs> if I could make a list of my friends who were straight edge, vegetarian, vegan at one point and who is now, yeah, there's uh, very few survivors. That's a fact. <laughs> I know. Everyone's like, wait, cheese is really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if there was a, uh, so actually I want to go back to the Ricky thing real quick. When you were like working with him, what was, do you remember what the workflow looked like and like how you guys would make a process, like how you worked with your processes of setting a show up? Because in my mind, because I have my own business and I'm always thinking about the behind the scenes of the structure and how people Right, or right. organize something. Did you guys have an organization style when you would work together? No, I don't think so. I think everything was probably in, done more like collectively, you know, like a collective. Like, um, I think we both had the same intention with what we were doing. Whoever really booked the bulk of the bands sort of, you know, took the financial, you know, uh, the financial thing for that show whoever was the lead for the show would do flyers. So now I don't remember anything specific mm. like that, honestly. Um, you I know, mean, communication, guess, a lot yeah. of probably talking on the phone and stuff, but um, yeah, besides for that, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I guess, I mean, in my head, it would just be, we've got a date. We got to get the bands um, and make sure that they're, then we got to figure out like what times they're going to play and then we got to flyer it. And where are we going to go to flyer it? Like, did you... Yeah, I mean, that stuff was pretty mapped out by that time. <laughs> like, yeah, I didn't even think like about kinda, that, though. Yeah, you had, like, you know, the, the Elks needed to open and close at a certain point. So, you know, like, you were stuck inside of those time timelines, and that was pretty well-worn. Um, you know, the flyering was... There was only so many places you could go and drop flyers. You know, there was maybe a dozen throughout you know, New York, New Jersey, Philly area that you could just like drop and it would do you any good. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff, you had to go to other shows, uh, yeah. and, you know, sit by the door and make flyers and make sure people knew about it. But did you guys say like, when you would show up to some shows with flyers, did you, were you ever denied by another promoter? Uh, no, but I think, you know, it could have started to get to that point with like clubs. Um, huh. The only time I'd seen that, I saw 
Uh, I saw some people fight back in the day about that. Um, again, I don't feel like getting into it, but the inf- it was at the Hamilton Street Cafe in Bambrook. Okay. Uh, <laughs> where somebody from like a rival production company came flyering and there was a fight. Um, <laughs> but I never ran into that, uh, that issue. But I guess I'd probably be sensitive enough to certain places to not like, I wasn't going to show up to like a CB show with my flyers or something, you know? Um, that's just like respect. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, you know, actually I want to kind of break this down a little bit because I really want people to get a clear picture of the amount of time you guys put into this shit. Right. And pretty much you, I'm guessing you didn't make any money or maybe if you did, it'd be like a couple bucks here and there that you'd pocket. Uh, yeah, none of it got pocketed. Cause like I went down on so many shows. Like, um, the one thing about Manville for all of its glory it was always a $500 haul, which for that time was not cheap. Yeah. Um, you know, that meant you, you literally couldn't charge more than six or seven bucks. You would have gotten your head chopped off at that time. Yeah. Um, I normally either did like five and four with a can of food. And then I made the big jump of doing $6 and five with a can of food. But that was like my limit to what I would charge for the show. So essentially, I needed a minimum of 100 people to just pay for the hall. And then everything else just started going to John Hiltz and the bands. Um, So it was a rare occurrence that I had so much that it carried over to anything else. Um, And if I did, I probably ended up giving it back to the hall or John for the previous times I couldn't pay them enough money. (laughs) Well, we got to think about Um, it. Like people listening, though, think about this, right? So here's here's a promoter who's at this point 16 15 16 right sure 16 17 16 say, 17 so this point, yeah. so you've got your license let's say at this point so you've got to he's got to book a hall that's 500 bucks guaranteed then he's got bands he's got to pay and he's got a sound guy he's got to pay um and then he's got to get a flyer done somehow either by himself i'm guessing you didn't hire a graphic designer like no i always yeah show. always self-made flyers cut and paste for so sure. cut and paste then then print this shit up and then you gotta take the time to go to a show to sit there and give these flyers out and then well the print there. the print you're overlooking the print up that was uh yeah, one of your it. biggest hurdles ah. was where does a 16 year old kid get 500 copies of something um so where is he getting from for for not that much money um so uh a lot of people had a scam in kinko's in new brunswick where like some kinko's employees they they had, kinko's had cards where you re- refilled the card you know like an arcade okay. um so if you could have someone hook you up with some money on a kinko's card but i had no hookups there i used to go to the office depot on uh the somerville circle um, I two hundred two, two hundred six there in the yeah. Central Circle, <laughs> yep. and I go to the back, and there they had the honor system, um, where you did your copies, you were doing them independently, you filled out a little ticket and brought it to the front to pay. So basically, I just for years scammed the office, or it was Office Max, it was Office Max or Office Depot, one of those, um. So basically for years, I just scammed them. Nobody really cared. Um, You know, I always had them in my backpack. uh, And the one or two times somebody asked about it, I said that a lot of the flyers I had already had and I needed an extra amount. I know it was dishonest, but uh, (laughs) it was the only way I knew how to get these. I didn't have like uh, a parent or something funding these things. Yeah. Uh, So... So that was my way to get flyers. But flyering was a – getting the copies was a big hurdle at that time for sure. you got to think too. That, I mean you got to think of the evolution of the flyer then. It goes from an 8 by 10 8.5 by 11 to the they cut them in half or they cut them in a fourth. You know, yeah. You guys can get – you know, you can double or quadruple your output for little money. I started doing that a little. I would do the half size just to, just to bang a little more out. For sure. Yeah. But the the other thing that was funny about that time was, you know, like um, long distance calling was still very much an issue. Uh, So, you know, I wasn't really dealing with booking agents at all. Like I would literally just deal with someone from the band normally. 
And um, so, you know, when I'm talking to somebody from Louisville, Kentucky or Buffalo or one of these towns, even for 10, 15 minutes, it started to get a lot. And yeah. within the first like two or three months of me getting really into shows, a couple phone bills came back that my mom fucking killed me for it. Like, <laughs> like crucify. It was bad. Like we didn't have the money for it and she was pissed. And, uh, you know, I had to figure out a way to pay it all back and it wasn't good. So I had to like extremely selectively use my long distance calling. So at the time I, um, had had a pager, uh, I was, you know, big into beeping as people were at the time. <laughs> yeah. I don't have, do I have to explain what the pager is to people? They still know what that no, is. No, anyone listening to this understands what a pager is. Okay. If, they, if they're okay. listening to this, they don't know what it is. They're probably uh, in the wrong place. Cool. So I would tell people to beat me, and there was a, a certain time, like probably about a year, where my good buddy Evan had started making um, these like fake phone dialers. So you, he would oh, take yeah. uh, these like pocket organizers from Radio Shack and do something to the back of it. I don't know what he did. And basically, like you could put the speaker of this pocket organizer up to the receiver of a payphone. And it mocked the sound of change going in. And it wasn't the change going in that signaled the phone. It was the noise. Yeah. So uh, so basically, I'd get a series of beeps. And I would have a friend like take me somewhere. Usually, the quick check on 22 was like my main go-to because it was pretty quiet. And... I'd bring like my show notebook that had all like my ideas and my phone numbers and stuff like that and sit at the payphone with like my dialer and my notebook. And I would, you know, dial the number of who I wanted to call. They would say, oh, you know, insert dollar seventy five to something, whatever, and then put the receiver up. And there was different noises for different coins so I would try to mix up like quarters and dimes and stuff to make it seem like, you know, I was like a guy sitting there with change. And most most often it worked. Um, sometimes it didn't like you would have. I remember like one time a pretty sassy operator got on. And it was just like, mm -mm, nice try. And then like and then just like got <laughs> off and canceled my whole thing. So like there was like some stuff going on. I guess people were on to it, but. I got away with that for a long time, and that was how I started to get away from the long-distance stuff. But I know that's weird for some younger kids, but, you know, long-distance calling used to be uh, quite the quite the thing. It was hard. I mean, that's why people wrote so many letters. You got It's like I just think of all the things that were made since then. You've got Instagram now where you can just flyer. Still, you got to do the time to design it. and then But you could put it out there and just do tags and whatever, and people are following you so you don't have to pay any money for paper and then you can just email shit to bands or yeah communication is just like crazy. changed dramatically but the thing is like you know and i think we touched on this in the last episode too where i really actively try not to be a self-righteous old person is um anytime i've been involved with stuff like that through the last like five to ten years i'm really bad at what people do now um like there is a whole nother style to the way people do it. And young people are completely tapped into the way that young people get information. Like, you know, like I had a band called bottom feeder a few years ago, like a hardcore band. And when we were releasing music, I had mentioned starting a MySpace to do the music and basically got <laughs> laughed out of the room by a bunch of guys in their twenties who were just like, nah, man, like, it's not a thing anymore like like what <laughs> and honestly it happened to me because up until gaslight had people working for us i had done mostly everything for every one of my bands like through the years you know um that's wild so i was in touch with all the stuff and then it got to a point where i started to be able to just be paid to travel and play music and do the press and I was involved in all decisions, but like, I didn't know how fucking local promoters in all these cities I was going to were promoting to the people they were, you know, that's not, it wasn't my job anymore. I had no fucking clue. 
So when it got to a point now where I'm back in the boat of, you know, being in bands that need to start from the ground up and do some work like that, if I was on my own doing this, I'd be fucking lost. Um, <laughs> like the person in my new band who does all that stuff is sitting in front of me, actually. Oh, hi, nice. Jared. You want to say hi? Hello. Hello, Jared. Yeah, that's Jared. Yeah, we're going to practice today, so he's actually in my drum space. Am I taking up me. your time right now? We're at an hour. No, no. no. Okay, good. We're at an hour? Well, maybe we should stop soon then. No, um, I mean, uh, tr- dude, but, I, I can keep talking. I just don't, I can talk yeah. all day, so you can. it's up to you, man. But go on. But yeah, so, um, yeah, and like he's done a number of things in the last year to like promote and put out a record and stuff like that that left to my own devices would have been done in a very antiquated way. And I can see that now, you know? So, um, yeah, there's an element of this. that's just like, it's time and energy, you know, like I got two little kids. I'm not sitting at the Knights of Columbus on a Thursday night. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm just not, um, there are some shows I go to. I don't like not go to shows. I don't not attend music. Um, but like, the idea that I could be as tapped in as somebody who's 16 and this is their whole fucking world. Like, it's just not possible. So I don't imagine that, uh, that like my way was better or less, um, difficult than it is now. It's just probably different. I I think there was probably a little more physical toil to the way we had to do things, but, um, you know, there probably is a whole nother, element of things happening now that i just have no idea about so i i I think i think i think it was cool and i think that it's cool to talk about and important for people to know like what it was like or whatever like that but i don't want it to come from a place of like yo this was like the way it should be done or something you know um because i don't believe that at all that's it's it's just different i i do think that there is a there's a sense of disconnect because of digital stuff, you know, because things aren't tangible. And I think when you hold on to something, you go to see it instead of watching on YouTube or, you know, just seeing a flyer on your phone, there's this big disconnect of actually having it, holding a flyer in your hand and, and being at a club and seeing a band. There's, I mean, watching a band on video and then seeing them live is, it, it's like night and day. But is there just a disconnect because you are an older person who knows the before and after? And if like, you were a person who is 18 years old now and was raised in the environment of just watching videos. Maybe they have the ability to have like the kind of visceral response you had at a show to a video. That's just not even possible for you because you knew it another way, you know, like, I don't um, know. I don't know. I think people in general, you know, there's a difference between if you had someone who was, who was talking to you, through a phone, it was 18, and then all of a sudden you talk to them in person, you would notice, they would notice the difference. I believe they would t- notice the huge difference. Why, just in communication style? Yeah, there's something between a digital landscape and then the physical landscape. And, I, I, you know, I, it's a kind of a bigger conversation, but I, I think that there, there might be a reason why people aren't so, I, I don't know, like connected to music anymore. Or, is, or maybe, I don't know. But, like, that's the thing. Like, if you just take sheer numbers, more people are connected to music currently than ever have in the history of mankind. Well, I think more I think more emotionally, though. I think, right. I think there's an emotional... If I'm on Spotify, I can easily like, just blast song to song to song from band to band to band. I was trying to listen to, like, the new face-to-face stuff the other day. And uh, I was going through it. I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, I'm over. I, like, halfway through. And I was like, yeah. And I went to the next thing and the next thing the next thing. I was like, Jesus Christ. You know, but if I had the vinyl, yeah. I put it down and just let it sit there. I'd be like, all right, you got my time. You know, I've been listening to Love Me Sexy by Jackie Moon every morning Love me for sexy. the last like week just to get in a good mood. I don't know. You ever seen the film Semi Pro? I possibly. Will Farrell owns uh, an ABA basketball team called no. the Flint Tropics. <laughs> no, I actually never saw that. Uh, well, he plays a character named Jackie Moon. <laughs> Who, who owns the team and plays power forward, but also wrote a hit funk song called Love Me Sexy previously <laughs> and was sort of a, a hit. But he did a full recorded version of it, Will Farrell, um, And it's okay. really funny and okay. really good. And I listen to it every morning. I'm just like looking it up now. 
<laughs> but the one cool thing I'd like to mention about that movie is that I'm reading this book about basketball. And yeah, apparently like that whole movie is real. Like the ABA and the stuff that used to happen. Um, wait, we didn't talk about that in the last episode, did we? I don't believe so. Yeah. So like for anyone who doesn't know, the ABA was a league that came out in the 70s that basically was created to fuck with the NBA and eventually get bought by them. Um, but in so doing, they you know, invented the three-point shot, the slam dunk competition. They sort of desegregated basketball in a lot of ways. Like it was a really pivotal league, but it was sort of like the wild, wild west. And like a lot of really interesting, funky people like own teams and a lot of weird, interesting players played for that league. So one thing I learned in this book is that the film Semi Pro, which I thought was just total slapstick comedy, is like half true. Um, so I'd like anybody to watch that film with that in mind. Interesting. Moving on. <laughs> kind of like the XFL when uh, uh, McMahon from the um, when wrestling was trying to do a football league. Well, no, I don't I think I don't think they had any yeah, influence. But... Yeah, it wasn't. It was never <laughs> legitimate, so you couldn't compare them. Like the ABA was like literally the home of like you know Dr. J and like oh wow you know, some some of the great basketball players and even some guys who were. Uh, would have been some of the best NBA players maybe of all time, but they were sort of blackballed from the NBA because of, you know, color and a lot of different reasons. They sort of flourished in that league too. So it's got a very interesting history. Like there's a lot, a lot to it. The XFL was, was, yeah, it was, a, was joke. a fucking joke. Yeah. Well, I actually, I, I did want to ask you, I have a couple more questions, but I did want to ask you because you're involved heavily in like local Jersey fantasy leagues, right? Uh, or used to be? Yeah, not about local Jersey, but yeah, I do a lot. Of, I do do a lot of fantasy. Yeah, I thought because I know. Um, I thought you were in a league with. Uh, oh yeah, I'm in the baseball league with all those guys with with the with your it. old crew with Anthony Shore. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like Anthony, and it's like Dave Flores from Taxi Cab yeah. Samurai, and then yep. I think my buddy Sean Bergen. I think he was in it too. Yep, Jim's in it. Like yeah, a bunch of people. Um, yeah. yeah, I've been in that league for probably about like 10 years oh, um yeah that's too much time man well it's a keeper league so you get to keep players from year to year oh. so it's yeah okay. it's a it's a very interesting league it's very cool and anthony's a been an excellent commissioner through the years oh i didn't know he was the commish nice yes he is he's I the boss i wouldn't see him being like a baseball guy i thought he was just more like a runner and loves root beer he is definitely a baseball guy he's very nerdy about it i really I appreciate it. i appreciate his statistical acumen he's a very good player <laughs> um if there was a local jersey band from back then that got together and played today actually i don't know if i want to wear it like that if it's like i want to take it from two aspects it's more of if that if there was a local jersey band that you loved got together and played today would you go rush to see them or if it was like a chance to go back in time to see a band you loved in that moment, I'm trying to think of which which one I want to go in. It's I'm thinking out loud right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could answer both those questions. I think. Like, okay. I mean, yes, if there were bands that I loved playing now, and I have gone to see them, you know, like Strength Six Nine One did shows, and I, I went. Um, you know, when Vision was doing shows, I went. Uh, when Shades Apart started getting back together, I went. Um, you know, like, these are bands that I loved when I was a kid who I would never uh, miss an opportunity to see. Um, for bands that I could go back in time and see, I mean, the one that always pops into my head is just, like, the idea of seeing the Bad Brains in their prime seems yeah. like maybe the greatest show you could possibly see it seems like um from what i hear about and from people's tales you know uh that's one i definitely like to see and then i have this sort of long uh rich history with jawbreaker and not being able to see them <laughs> basically like did you miss I all had, the shows that came up right yeah recently? i had tickets to see them in like the 90s and i got punished um <laughs> the weekend before for going with my friends to a show in Pennsylvania and my mom didn't let me go to city gardens. And it not only 
was my last opportunity to see Jawbreaker is my last opportunity to go to City Gardens. So I actually never got to go to City Gardens. It's because my mom punished me. Um, Wait, what was the Pennsylvania show that you went to? Just to uh, see if it was with worth the band, it. It was with the band Bound from okay. New Jersey, or at the time X Bound X. Okay. Uh, they were my friends from Hillsboro who went to open a show in uh, at Beaver College in Pennsylvania. I think with the band Next Step Up, a hardcore band. Okay. Um, but the singer of that band Bound ended up being the singer for uh, like Kid Dynamite and um, Oh Jason. Yeah, Jason. Yeah. He was the singer from Bound. Okay. So I went with them. I got caught and I got banned from City Gardens. And then my wife and I had tickets last uh, winter to see them. And, you know, a kid issue, hospital, couldn't go. And then we had tickets again to see them just a couple months ago and they canceled the shows. So I think I'm done trying. <laughs> I yeah. think there's just something cosmically telling me that I shouldn't see John Breaker. <laughs> Jesus. All right, real quick, last question. Um, yeah. So I usually ask what you want to plug, but if you want to just say that real quick, but um, sure. what what scene ethics do you still hold on to to this day? Uh, I mean, I think we like it's it's really quick for me to to say because it's become really clear, you know, through being around this for a long time, like. The thing that's most important to me at this point is for this place to always be like welcome to anyone who needs it. You know, I don't I um, really resent when this thing turns into a fashion contest, when it turns into a popularity contest, when it turns into swinging dicks. Um, I think it's antithetical to the whole purpose of what we're doing. Um and I think if you don't understand that, then like you're probably not going to wind up being a person who's committed to it your whole life anyway. But you see it, you know, the people who hold on to it, like you see them become teachers and and, uh, you know, professionals and go into different shit and they manage to carry some of the weight of what they kind of learned from that scene through their life. And that's really important to me because. There's not a lot of outlets these days for people to be, honestly, to be like unabashedly and fuck you progressive. Um, a place where like, like you don't have to feel like, like I've always been in the mindset that, yeah, I'm like from this perspective, but you're not allowed to fuck with me and you're not allowed to fuck with my friends. And like, I think there's something missing there. And I think when people find a real community in punk and hardcore, then they can, they can carry that stomach with them. And then they can bring that fight with them into like real life situations. And I just wish, and I hope that that stays part of it, you know, through all of it. And I think it is honestly, um, you know, from what I can see, the things that were happening when I was a kid are still happening everywhere. So it still seems like a place that people can go, but that's just the, the most important thing to me that's great did you want to do you want to plug and then the plug or? yeah yeah i'm like uh should listen to my band mercy union we just did a record in october um it's awesome i think maybe not i don't know i like it but uh and <laughs> <laughs> i hate that i just said it's awesome i feel like such a jag for saying that do i say it all the time <laughs> do plugs this is why i don't do plugs so you, i should have made you do this uh but we're going on tour in the spring with laura jane grace we got a lot of stuff coming up this year so i just i don't know just want people to listen to that record you decide if you like it or not okay i don't i have no opinion no opinion All right. <laughs> that's my plug that's how good i am at plugging <laughs>